Well, good evening, everyone. Am I on? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I'm Matt. I'm the preacher here. Nice to meet you. How's that? No, it really is so great to be back. I flew down on July the 10th and thought I was going to be coming back on the 19th. And, uh, I can't remember what I've told you, so if I've told some of you this and I'm repeating myself, just say, whoa, stop. Um, Thought I'd be flying back on the 19th, and that was the day of that big Delta IT outage that was pretty much worldwide. Uh, So rescheduled the flight for the 23rd, and some things happened between the 19th and the 23rd that it was best for me to stay put. And so um, my mother-in-law, Ginger, passed on August the 6th. Uh, We had her funeral on the 15th, and before and after, uh, we spent a lot of time helping my father-in-law. This is him. This is David. This is Hannah's dad. Helping him clean out, clean up, and do some repairs around his house and get it on the market. So um, I had four weeks of vacation this year and I uh, didn't intend to use them all at once, but I did. And the elders were generous with time and letting me be away. And you were patient and kind and generous. And um, we're so thankful for all of it. I mean, truly thankful for all of it. Um, thankful to be home. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's been not the summer we anticipated. So, but thank you. Well, how about you all? What do you want to pray about tonight? Now, I've got the ones listed that were mentioned a moment ago. Maybe there are others. All right, Pam. Pam. Joey? Let's pray. God, we know you're good. We know you're great. And we know that your steadfast love does endure forever. We know you're the creator. We know you to be the redeemer. Who not only makes, but makes anew. And we know that you have shown that uh, in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In him you show us that you intend to make all things new, including our bodies, uh, which waste away and decay here as as we live in them. Father, I'm not going to try to cover it up. It just hurts. It just hurts. There's a lot of pain in our body right now. And God, we... We love the opportunity to get to rejoice with each other, and we do. And God, we celebrate the way that you've been so faithful to, uh, to our family, uh, Hannah's and mine, and uh, celebrate the way that you have brought Scott Lucas in through some of his ordeals. Uh, Father, I celebrate the way that JT came through surgery and 
Uh, the many answered prayers that I know that I'm, I'm not even aware of right now that are just sitting around us, but God, we also mourn and, and weep. It's, it hurts, God, uh, to love and to see people we love that are, that are hurting. So, Father, I just pray that uh, the spirit that Austin mentioned lives in us. I pray that tonight you would, through your spirit, just pour your love into our hearts and help us to feel your presence, to sense your nearness, to taste your goodness, and to, uh, at least for a moment, have rest from the trouble. Uh, God, I specifically want to ask that you would uh, you hear my prayer on behalf of the Augustines, for Jay and Diane, and the, the journey that they're on right now. And I pray that you would guide Lori as she's navigating a cancer diagnosis. I pray the same guidance for Martha. And I pray that you will sustain her body as she navigates uh, this, this season. I pray for Corey and for Keisha. And I pray for Howard and for Charles and for Chase and Sarah. And pray for Pam, God. And I also pray that these cancer treatments, this new regimen would be effective and that you would strengthen her body for a, for a battle. And I know she's a fighter. And I know that if it were a battle of sheer strength, Pam would beat cancer. Uh, God, at the same time, I, I just pray that you will strengthen her even more than her own strength. Help her to overcome this cancer. Strengthen her body. And I pray that you would eradicate it from her body. I do pray that you'd be with Scott and Patty as they're traveling to Greece. Keep them safe. Uh, and Father, I pray that they know that they're loved and missed while they're away. And that we eagerly await their return. I pray for safety for Scott and Shirley as they travel through Forks and back. I pray that you will bless our students and our teachers and our aides and our, all of the staff and faculty that, that work in schools and school systems. And Father, as a new school year begins, I pray that this would be a time uh, where, where good things can happen, where people can grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with you and with people. Uh, and Father, I pray for Sherry. I pray that you will bring peace. I pray that you will give her strength for her battle. Uh, Father, support her. Support Joey. Uh, Father, I just pray that you will bless them. I pray you'll be with Cayenne right now as she flies to Denver to be with her brother Mike. And I pray that his health issues would be, would be minimal and that she'd be able to be there, enjoy the company, and return knowing he's in good hands and in good health. I pray that you'll bless the rats as they uh, let go of a house they've lived in for a long time and made a lot of memories in. Father, I pray that you will help them to end their time there celebrating the good, letting go of the bad, and anticipating what is still to come in, in, uh, in North Dakota. Father, with our brother Mike, uh, thank you for how far he's come in this battle and uh, the way he's fought and the way that he's shown Jesus in the midst of his struggle. And I can say the same about Pam and, and others and Martha. and God, I just pray that you continue to walk with him and, and uphold him and strengthen him as he deals with cancer. For Anne, I pray that the break that she's experiencing would heal quickly. And I pray that uh, it wouldn't be too inconvenient for her, but that you would just bless her and return her to her health soon. For Brown, I pray that you will help him to heal quickly, to get the help he needs so that his body can be put back together. And for Miss Betty, God, you know what she means to us. And I just pray that you help her to come through COVID quickly and to uh, be in health for a while, God. I pray that you'll bless our class tonight as we continue a discussion we were having before uh, I went south. And just pray you'd bless this time. And again, God, regardless of what we talk about, I just pray that we'd experience you, your presence, your love, and the, the dearness of the fellowship of your people tonight. Pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you for letting us spend time in prayer and for being honest. And uh, if you were mentioned, even if you weren't, just know that prayers continue for you. Prayers continue for you. Okay. Well, I'll admit, I'm still playing catch up. I had a long list of things I was trying to get done before I left. I got a lot of it done. And I came back and thought, I'm get it done quickly. And I'm still not caught up. So what I thought we'd do tonight is do a really good review of where we've been. And I'll tell you where I'd like to go with this. Uh, and then we'll see where we end up after that. I want to say thank you to Scott and to Ross and to Skip and to Bob who taught for me while I was away. Thank you guys. I 
they're not all here, but thank you. Thank you. And tonight, just a reminder of where we've been and where we're going. Austin, can I click? There we go. We're talking about being great neighbors. And this was something that I shared earlier in the summer. We didn't really have a clear direction. No one gave us much input on where to go. But this was something that was on my heart because of uh, an experience I had with a neighbor in our neighborhood where I met her in the, in the yard one night. We were visiting, and I asked her how her, how her husband was doing. And she said, well, well, he died in February. And that was, I had my nose to the grindstone with doctoral stuff and had not been out much, out much during the winter. I didn't know that, she, that he had passed away. And it was, it was embarrassing, but even more, it was convicting, and it made me think about, well, what does God want from us as neighbors? And so we began this study before I left, and I just want to visit a little bit more of what we've talked about before. So I just want to remind you, these are some scriptures that you can take a picture of this slide, go through and read. But some of the ones that are highlighted, I'd like for us to open our Bibles together and read these and just remind ourselves of why being a neighbor is such an important thing to God. And so let's start in Leviticus chapter 19, please. Leviticus 19. If I could get a reader for 19 verse 18, I would be very grateful. Okay. Okay, in the middle of Leviticus, one of my favorite books of the Old Testament, this is what we get. And this is what Jesus says is the summary of the law. That what matters to God, what he thinks is most important, is loving our neighbor as ourselves. This is how Jesus summed up the law and the prophets, what the Bible is really trying to get us to, to do, if you will. To love people. And I start here, but this same command is repeated more than... I believe it's eight times throughout Scripture, this command to love neighbor as self. So it's pretty important to God, consistently across time, across the Testaments. So go to Proverbs 27, verse 10. This is one that we didn't read when we looked at this material the first time. But don't you have a look at this. I was reading this earlier and thought, man, this, this fits us in Great Falls very well. Proverbs 27, verse 10, someone. Do not forsake your friend and the friend of your father, and do not go to your brother's house when disaster strikes him. Better a nearby neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. I was reflecting on those words and thought, that sounds a whole lot like Great Falls, because so many of us in Great Falls have family that are somewhere else in the world or somewhere else in the culture. And so we depend on each other in Great Falls to be family to one another, to be neighbors to one another, because in many cases it's the brother, the sister, the mother, the father that's far away. And so this is another little snippet, I think, that shows us at a practical level why neighboring is so important. We depend on each other because often our families are far away and our neighbors are who we have. Uh, Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Get another reader, please. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Go ahead and read verse 10 as well, please, Aaron. Love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the proof of the fulfillment of the law. I love this passage for a number of reasons, but this is one of several times where Paul basically says, you can study your Bible from cover to cover, but when it comes to application, it, it, this is really what it all boils down to. If you want to fulfill the law and the prophets, if you want to be the expression of God's intent, for you, you and for the world, it's this, love your neighbor as yourself. And so clearly, and there are other passages that you can look at on the screen, but this is one of those things 
that God, through his word, tells us matters most. I would even go so far as to say that it's at the heart of God's will for his people. And so no matter how we look at other things, there, there are a lot of other things that are important. Uh, there are a lot of other things that are talked about in Scripture, but we've got to find a way to relate them to this. Because if we don't get this, from a scriptural standpoint, we're really missing the boat, aren't we? This is it. It's what Jesus said matters the most. Now, in reviewing this, um, some things we've already talked about a little bit. One of the things we talked about was that being a great neighbor means embracing a mission mindset. Embracing a mission mindset. Uh, and that, by mission, I mean mission is God's effort to renew and restore the world. The world's, world's broken because of sin. God's got this good plan, this good purpose to put it back together through Jesus, through the Spirit, through the people of God. Loving a neighbor means embracing a mindset that says, I want to be a part of that because that's what God's doing in the world. And if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 11, 1, you'll remember this is one of those places where Paul says, here's really what it means to be missional. This is what it means to be a person of God that's, that's working for God's purposes in this world. And so let's read these verses together. And I want to point out, again, just a few characteristics of a mission mindset. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through verse 11, 1. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Thank you. So really what we're trying to do is marry this idea of being a good neighbor and being a part of God's mission in the world. And here, 1 Corinthians, Paul in 1 Corinthians gives us several characteristics of what a mission mindset looks like or what it looks like to be a great neighbor. And here's one of the things he says. He says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, that's huge. It's talking about everything. God cares about everything, not just what we do on Sunday. Not just the, the religious or holy things we do. It, it all matters to God. And so being a good neighbor is not just about church or church things or religious things. It's about all the stuff of life. Um, even as something as simple as repairing a fence or cutting someone's yard or watering someone's sod, like Skip did for me for a few weeks. Um, that's being a good neighbor. The entire gamut of life. Uh, the glory of God. He says, whatever you do, do it all to the glory or the honor. Do it to honor God. Neighboring is not ultimately just about neighbors. Remember, loving our neighbor is that place where our love of God shows up in the world. Huh? Loving our neighbor is where the love of God shows up in the world. And so we glorify God, we be good neighbors. Those two go together. He says, give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do. Um, we're not seeking our own good when we're talking about being a good neighbor. We're trying to help other people and bless them and build them up. That's a mission mindset. It's also being a good neighbor. Um, the ultimate goal. He says, I do it. Not seeking my own advantage. This isn't about me, he says. I'm seeking the salvation of many. When we're good neighbors, I don't think we're neighbors just so that we will convert other people. We're neighbors because we have been converted. Um, but if we do have a goal, I hope every neighbor that I have in my neighborhood eventually comes to know the Lord. And I hope every person I come in contact with eventually comes to know the Lord. That's where, we, where it ultimately is going. Of course, whether or not people are there yet, we still love them as we love ourselves, as we love the Lord. It's the goal of salvation. And then he says, be imitators of me as I am of Jesus. Being a good neighbor means following in the footsteps of Jesus. We can learn a lot from listening, listening to his life. So, any thoughts so far? Some of this is just review, but um, any thoughts so far on a mission mindset, Shirley? Well, one of the things I think about is it takes time. Mm. It takes time to do that. So oh, man. Sometimes Yeah. Be a good neighbor. I learned that in a big way 
this winter and I <laughs> because of my Achilles and because of my terminal illness this so I was home more and my neighbor across the grass needed me. Hmm. She needed me and stopped for six months. She's now moved to Fort Benton, but it took time yeah. and I had had the time. Yeah. And decided to use my time a little bit differently than I have in the past because it, it took time to do that. Well, so it, it's hard sometimes. But yeah. That actually leads right into this question which I was going to put up here. Uh, maybe I already did, but what prevents Jesus' disciples from living as a good neighbor with a mission and mindset? That's one thing. A lot of times we're just too busy. We're, we're, I'm very task oriented. I, I get locked into what I'm doing. And it's so easy for me to get uh, focused on the end, the, you know, the thing I'm trying to get done, that sometimes I forget that there's lost people around me. <laughs> I'm serious. And that, that's what I do with my life. I'm so busy doing ministry that I forget to be about mission. Ouch. You ever done that? So we can get task oriented. We can get too busy about our own things and not have the time. What else prevents us from living as good neighbors with a mission mindset? I think we can focus too much on things that are far away. Mm. Those are good. Okay, so did, were you able to hear what Amy said? Okay. We can focus on something that's far away, whether it's overseas. Uh, we can focus uh, on everybody else but our family. So that, and, and that's just as much a... Focusing on everybody else but our family, that's not missional, is it? No, it's not. Our family are our neighbors too, and I have to remind myself of that. Um, our family are our neighbors too. What else? What prevents us from living with this mission mindset that that the characteristics we see here? Connie? Fear is kind of strong in mind and I believe. Mm-hmm. Good. So time can be something, a focus far away, whether it's a far away focus in space or a far away focus in time. Fear can be something. What else prevents us from this kind of mindset? There's clearly a lot of things that can trip us up when it comes to this. I talked about this. Here's one. I had this on the screen. Shared this a while back. One writer said this is the number one obstacle to neighboring well. And he asked the question, which I found rather convicting, do we live at a pace that allows us to be available, like what you mentioned, Shirley? And here's the question that will really just hit you between the eyes. Is what I'm doing more important than the Great Commission, the Great Commandment, or the Great Compassion? So Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, as you're going into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Great commission. What's the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, and so the great compassion, this may be less familiar to you, but I heard someone call it this once, and I've, I've kind of latched onto it. Uh, but that passage in Matthew 25, where Jesus is at the judgment scene, and he's got two groups of people, all of whom call him Lord. That's important. All of them acknowledge his lordship. I think what he's talking about there are believers, people that claim to be Jesus' followers. And he says to the people on his right, those who claim to be his followers are on the right, y'all, come on, go with me to the kingdom prepared from the foundation. Why? What does he say? He says, I was hungry and you did what? 
uh, I was hungry and you gave me drink. I was th food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was sick, you came to me. I was in prison. Um, I may have missed one there. But then the ones on the left are the ones who called him Lord, but they didn't practice his will in these kinds of areas. So is what I'm doing more important than the great commission, the great commandment, the great compassion? It's sobering. But sometimes time in those ways can keep us. The fear barrier. I appreciate Connie's honesty on this because I also struggle with it sometimes. Fear distorts our view of ourselves and others. Remember that story in the, when Joshua and Caleb and the spies go into the land and they come back and what do they say they were like? They saw giants, but what did they say they were like to the people? They said, we are like grasshoppers. They were afraid. And so fear distorted their view of the people that were in front of them. It also distorted their view of themselves. Fear distorts our view of ourselves and others. Someone's got to break the cycle. And I love this quote, the truth is awkwardness won't kill us. Um, I need to be reminded of that. But these are some things that prevent or hinder a mission mindset. Shirley. I think our own friends. Say this, more. This Ben said in one of our ladies' classes, um, he says, you know, I don't talk to my friends at Barnett Church. Hmm. Mm -hmm. that we like to sit by it wherever, or like to go and do things with, and doesn't really allow us sometimes time to do other things or yeah. bring other people into our circle. Well said. We can get in our own little bubble, our own little huddle, however you want to look at it. Someone calls them a holy huddle. I've heard that before. But yeah, that can, that can prevent a mission mindset. Crystal? Yeah, and I think you see that in the example you gave, that Betty has now had that mindset, and through her friendship, she's now passing that on. So it, I can see how it does cut both ways on that, for sure. Mr. Mike? No, Matt, I was thinking of this, this May, you know, I retired after 54 years of preaching. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that I had in the constant battle is I allowed church folks sometimes to affect my mission mindedness. Ooh. It is. I appreciate your humility, and I'd, I'd echo that. I'd, I hope that we could all echo that and just be honest with the, the challenge of it at times. So we talked about some things that hinder us from having this mindset. Again, a lot of this is review, so if it's not new to you, that's probably not a bad thing. But let's think about what promotes a mission mindset. We've already talked about friends can do that. And I think that's what Hebrews 10 is talking about, right? He says, don't neglect to meet together. Why? Because we're afraid we're going to, yeah. Do we neglect to meet together because we're afraid of losing our salvation? No, we, we do it because we want to stir one another up to love and to good deeds. So that friendship thing you're talking about. We're to irritate each other into doing good work is kind of the sense of the original language. To, to kind of stay after each other so that we do good. So that's a mission mindset. But there's also this passage that, we read together, and I want to read again. It's uh, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. This is a good one. This is really good. Jesus is trying to help his disciples cultivate a mind like his. A mind that, that, that sees, sees the lost, hurting people around him. 
And I want you to notice what Jesus does to help others catch that mindset. What he says, what he does. Matthew 9, 35, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. Boy, there is a mission mindset. Someone who goes around in word and in deed, pointing other people to God's good reign in the world. That's a mission mindset. Okay, so this is what he's doing. Now, how does he help other people to catch this? Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Chapter 10, verse 1, and he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over the unclean spirits and We could continue reading, but verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, and again, you can read chapter 10 for his instructions. The three things I saw here I want to point out, and again, review. First of all, Jesus saw the need, and he didn't just see the need, he helped other people around him see the need too. He saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And that's an Old Testament phrase with a a very rich meaning if you want to do some study on it. Um, First shows up in the the life of Moses, then it shows up a little bit later. But Jesus saw the need and he helped other people see the need by pointing it out, by raising their awareness of the need. And then what did Jesus do? Did Jesus just get to work and do it all himself? Is that what he did? No. No. Did he just tell them, okay, you guys get to work, so you can do it all by yourselves? No. He invited his disciples to pray for workers. Why do you think he asked them to pray for workers? What you pray for, you become. Yes. What you pray for, you become. Jesus is showing us something about prayer here. We become what we pray for. I love how you said it, Scott. It's very simple. It's so true. And so he ignites their passion uh, for for mission by inviting them to pray about mission. And it apparently is effective because chapter 10, he then sends them out. He sends them out. He doesn't just ask them to pray. He gives them something to do, a purpose to act on. And I think it's interesting that they they come back and then they're with him and they, they learn some more lessons after they come back. But this is the group he'll eventually send into all the world. And this is how he began to ignite their mission mindset, helping them see the need, pray about it, and go and do something about it. And so that's developing a mission mindset. Any, uh, any additional thoughts before I go any further on any of this? Scott? Well said. So I try to cast that vision for them, even though they're not even Christians yet. But, mm-hmm. So it's basically a, it's a moot point for them. They already have them. They're not going to send them all to take them off or anything. And it's not a matter of salvation. No. We had to do a little bit of discussion on that. But, you know, sometimes uh, we look at people and we're judgmental and instead of seeing them as harassed and, and helpless and sheep without a shepherd, we need to see their need. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, go for it. I kind of with Ann, the sheep without the shepherd. So yesterday I had an opportunity to in front of nine people. It was just I was excited. Um, they were like, Thanks for coming. They were frustrated because we got a new piece of industry and she comes from the school district, the lunch lady, right? 
she slept with one of our PAs and she was she started to crazy. She she sounded like you last year. Mm. And I'm like, and I'm just quiet and I'm just observing and she listens and I'm learning how to just I'm listening. Good work, Jessica. Turned to me and they're like, Jessica, how do you do it? And I'm like, Did you see last year? <laughs> I was a mess last year. Did you see me work in the summer? No, for a reason. She goes, No, 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 how do you do it like with life? And I'm like, No, we're talking about work here. Like, we were just talking about her. Okay, so I'm like, What do you mean? With your kids and your job and your car and your car, how do you do it? Like, and why are you so happy? And it was like nine teachers. I'm like, It's not, it's giving me the chills right now. Because it was like, Oh man, my heart beating so fast. And I'm so glad I'm here, and I'm so glad to be consistent on coming, mm-hmm. because it does help me. And prayer, I've been telling God, can help me understand every time I come. Not just coming mm-hmm. to like this on a Friday, okay, bye. Like, actually having an eternity, understanding who he is. So I had that opportunity, and I spoke. I didn't, I don't know if I spoke again, but I'm like, you know, if you guys could speak, because I know what I'm coming in and not to be patient. And I didn't want to scare him away, and our job, we're not supposed to talk about it. You can, but then there's some that are hiding. I'm like, ah, uh, well, you know, faith and hope. And then the other walk away this morning. Kept on, kept on. And so I'm like, okay, well, and Shayna was the one that was having issues. I'm like, well, you, I don't even know if you believe God or not. I'm not sure where you're at, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, Bible studies, you know, getting into the word. You know, talk to me about David. So, and then another one walks away. I'm like, oh, God, oh, cool. I'm going to stop right here. Because I seen it like they just, I didn't try to stop them, but I just slowly seen them just, you know, but they were all in tune. And so I said, faith and hope mm-hmm. for the other one. And then I said, hey, I know you, I know if you believe God or not. You know, if you have that baby at home or just what you got going on in your life, but that's a good start, you know. Yeah. And I said, just talk to me about David. And I'm like, God, like, so I'm just having fun. <laughs> like, you know, so I know she's interested. So yeah. I think I have my, she's in my building now. So I think I have, if I could just get one. Yeah. I don't gotta get all nine. It's okay. <laughs> but if I could just get that one, so that's my next girl. There and also, and so that's why being here, being involved, really like full heart and then mentally and, and spiritually, that's gonna help each and every one of us. I know I'm young, still, <laughs> but I'm learning, and and God is is leading the way. The Holy Spirit that's what's leading me. He He leads the way. There you so go. I know I was so nervous at that moment, but I'm like, Jesus, this guy really good. And I seen those little girls walking around. Sounds like you and Jesus have a lot in common. <laughs> but I kept trying to go, and I'm like, another one walked away. I'm like, she's like, just talk about David. I'm like, okay, so she caught my drift. Like, she's seen, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, I got you. Okay, sit down. You're right, I'm alcoholic. I'll see you later. So. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that, Jessica. Yeah, it sounds like you and the Lord have a lot in common. I mean, right. <laughs> Spirit's given you what you need in that moment, just as yeah. he said. And I trust that. We're going that but, you know, Jesus had people walk away from him, too. And even if we tell the truth with grace, it doesn't mean everyone's going to accept it. And we just love, love people anyway and continue being good neighbors anyway because it's who we are. And our being good neighbors is not, a, is not contingent on who they are. You know, God calls us to be a certain kind of people. And so I really appreciate you, you sharing some of that because that, that extends some of this. Jesus sent out his disciples, and one of the things they did was form churches. Everywhere they went, they left the church, and the church is there to strengthen the people of God for God's work in the world. And so that's, that's good. We went on from this uh, <clears throat> developing a mission mindset, and the last time we got together before, uh, before I went south, we were talking about, okay, if we have this mission mindset, how can we, how can we live it out? Okay, and this... This is when we talked about farming, okay? Jesus says that working to promote God's reign in the world, helping people recognize God as the good king, that's a lot like farming. And so what might change if we imagine being a good neighbor is farming? We talked about this a little bit. And remember, here's some of the things we shared. For a long time, we thought about conversion. I say we, churches of Christ collectively, thought about conversion as crossing a line, all right? You're either in the circle or you're out of the circle. And salvation is all about moving into that circle, crossing that line. And you're either in or out. And of course we know, and it's true, the line is what? It's baptism. Right. And so there's some truth to this. I'm not rejecting it wholeheartedly. 
Um, the difficulty is that that worked really well at a time when, when most people were right at the line and they were really, really close. Uh, is anything different today? Are most people that we're going to meet in the world that are not Jesus followers, are they right at the point where they're ready to step across the line in baptism? No, no not at all. And so Paul Hebert, he's an anthropologist who worked at Fuller Seminary for a number of years, he started talking about what he called, instead of the boundary, he talked about the center. And the idea is not just about crossing the line, that's important. But for most of the people we encounter, we need to help start thinking about helping them move one step closer to Jesus. If they're going away from him, then before they take another step, we need, to, we need to help them figure out how can they turn toward him. And even if they're not yet at the line, how can we help them make that turn to where they're at least looking toward him? Now here's the thing. Almost all of the evangelism literature I've studied in school and collected, I used to collect Bible studies from Churches of Christ because um, I was interested in learning how to do evangelism better. And almost every single study I encountered was bounded set. And so for years we didn't think about evangelism as helping people do this. We thought about it as helping people do this. Okay? We're at a time now where we've got to start thinking about the center. Well, we said, well, how do you do that? How do you help people come closer to the center? One of the major things we talked about, and I'm saying this just as a reminder, and we'll kind of pick up here next week. One of the big reminders is that most of the people we're dealing with have trust issues with Christians trust issues with the church. I told you the story about Daniel, just a reminder on him. Daniel was the guy that was working with the church, and he starts praying about how can God use him to reach people in his neighborhood, and do you remember what he did? He got a job where? He got a job at Starbucks, yeah. Hey, you guys, this is awesome. Okay, oh, it's on the screen, you cheater. Oh. I guess I'll give it to you. Well, anyway, so he goes to Starbucks, and he's thinking, you know, I'm going to go here, and they're just going to meet this cool, hip Christian, and just in no time at all, they're all going to follow the Lord, because what they've never, they've just never met somebody that's cool enough to tell them the truth, and they'll listen. Well, he gets there, and he finds that they all believe in God. These are people who pray that are actually very spiritual people. What he found, though, Daniel, almost everyone at Starbucks had experienced some breach in trust with God, or with Christians. God had hurt them, and so they were angry, disappointed, sad, fill in the, the blank on the emotion, but God had hurt them, or at least they perceived that he did, or some other Christian or the church itself had hurt them. So Daniel wasn't starting at ground zero. Think about this. That line of zero, that you know, zero to one would be conversion. He's not starting at zero. Rather, he's starting at, sorry, I can't get my slides to do what I want. He's starting at negative three or four. And so the biggest thing Daniel learned is that people in this generation, and that's it's not just my or younger generations, it's also older ones. The biggest thing Daniel learned is that people in this generation have a prior question of trust that must be addressed before you can have a meaningful spiritual conversation with them. And the guy that wrote this book that tells this story, Rick Richardson, he says we've got to assume that people have trust issues. And so we don't go in and automatically start talking about baptism. We don't go in and automatically start talking about the way God designed the church to function, what's right and what's wrong about denominationalism or whatever. We start with the idea that we've got to build trust if we're ever going to get any movement at all. And so how do we do that? Well, some of the material we talked about when we went through this, just again, a reminder, we've got to be people of character, people of integrity, who have good intentions. A lot of people in the world don't think that we're really up to something good. In fact, it's becoming increasingly common in our culture. People believe Christians have a negative agenda, and they often associate that with how political, how we hold our stance toward politics. Uh, they, they question our intent question our integrity, our character. Uh, so being people of character, being people of competence, uh, doing what we say we will do, delivering on what we say we will deliver on, um, that's
that's how we, we build trust with people. And so how do, we, how do we do that? How do we demonstrate character and confidence? Here are 13 behaviors that I shared with you. I want you to notice, see if anything stands out as we just review these again very quickly. Um, this is what it means to be a missional person, at least partly. I would say this is partly what it means to be a good neighbor. I would say those are very close to the same thing. Being a good neighbor, being a person who works for God's work in the world. It's about talking straight. Um, talking straight, demonstrating respect. Uh, being transparent. If we do wrong, make a mistake, we got to own it. Uh, don't, don't deny it, don't pass the buck, we got to own it. And do what we can to make it right. Show loyalty. Show loyalty. Something that's so lacking in our culture. We got to show loyalty. Deliver on results. And so you can see, uh, these are just some of the things. Here's 7 through 12. Get better. When we are making mistakes, when we're not living up to expectations, make a visible effort to improve what we can and get better. Confront reality. Confront reality means that I'm not just denying that things are the way they are. Uh, that's, uh, that's a hallmark of anxiety, and we live in a very anxious time. Very anxious time. So being willing to talk about what's actually happening, reality. Clarifying expectations. I would say this is one of the ma major causes of conflict is that we have unclarified expectations. It leads to frustration, disappointment, anger, resentment. And, uh, but practice accountability. Practice accountability. Listen first. Keep commitments. And then here's the last one. Extend trust to other people. Aaron, what do you want to jump in with? Um, could you go back to that last one? <coughs> sure. When you said clarify expectations, what are you talking about there? What are you really looking for in a relationship with people? Are you really just being friends with them so that they'll come to church with you? Or are you really being friends with them because it's who God expects you to be? What are you really looking for from this relationship? So you're not talking about relationships between me and other people. You're just talking about what's going on inside of me when I reach out to someone. I, I'm, that's an example of it. Yeah. Just be up front with what you want from people. Don't have a hidden agenda might be another way to, to say it. Be transparent. See, all of these kind of, they kind of go hand in glove with one another. Um, I hope that helps, Aaron. Then that last one, as we saw, was extend trust. Show people that we trust them by depending on them, letting them help us. Um, but these are some very simple behaviors that um, I think they help us live more missionally because they help us build trust with people. These are the same things as what it means to be a good neighbor as well. Because again, being missional, being neighborly, I believe the Bible would tell us that those are the very same things. So each of these behaviors help reach to build trust, help our neighbors move closer to the, the ultimate center. Now, just as we wrap up, I'm finished. I've got two slides. I'll be very quick with them. But just kind of a summary of where we've been, and in our summary tonight, this has just been reviewed mostly. And maybe if you didn't get it, get it the first time, this can be fresh for you. Uh, but being great neighbors is one of the two things Jesus said mattered most. We become great neighbors by embracing a mission mindset that takes the long view, the same way that farming does. And one of the greatest needs that we have with people is to rebuild trust. And that's where we left off before I left off. Um, so here's where we're going next, Lord willing. I'd like to spend the rest of uh, the next four weeks, September, uh, finishing up this, because to be honest, this was very much on my heart and mind before I left and it got interrupted. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to finish this. Next week, Living Questionable Lives. Uh, the next week, we're going to talk about what the gospel is. Uh, that'll be fun. And then the 18th and 25th, hopefully get really, really practical. What do we do to actually live this stuff out? And then I've got an idea for where we'll go after that, but if you have input, I'm happy to go a different direction. But uh, what I'm thinking for October through the rest of the year, I would love for us to study the Holy Spirit together. And that's that's something I've been thinking about and praying about, but I'm very open to your input and your, your guidance. So, uh, Mike, would you dismiss us? Thank you.
others and to approve and to to look at ourselves and to better understand your desires for us and, and what and what difference that we can make. And thank you for what matters, Father. And we pray that we continue to be good students, not just in in, in learning, but in practicality. And that if we don't know our names, we would find out who we are and, and ask you, Father, to give us the power to be able to Whatever decision we make, however it is, I just pray that they might see Jesus in us. And if not, at that time, somewhere down the road, remember that they saw what Jesus looked like in someone else. We thank you.